Hi, I'm Ian Griffiths, Engine Technical Fellow and Microsoft MVP. And in this video, I'm going to show you how to write a custom c -sharp Spark job and run it inside of an Azure Synapse Spark cluster. So to begin with, we're going to need to create the relevant resources in Azure. So I've come into the Azure portal and I'm typing in Azure Synapse in the new resource entry. And I want to select the workspaces preview because that's the one that's going to let me create things in Spark. So I'm going to set up a new resource group just for this, which I'm going to call Synapse Custom Spark Job, obviously enough. I'm also going to create the workspace, and this is the point of this. This is a new Azure Synapse workspace, and this is going to be the thing that will host the Spark environment that my custom job will run in. I'm going to create this in North Europe because that's a data center fairly near to me. I'm also going to create a new Azure Data Lake storage account just for this illustration. I'm going to give that a similar name to the workspace. And I'm going to create a file system inside of there because we're going to need one of those to hold the files that make up my custom job. So it's going to take a little while for Azure to create the resources. So while we're waiting for that to happen, I'm going to go and configure security on the newly created storage account so that I have the necessary permissions to upload the custom job once I've built the thing. So just to make this easier to access in the future, I'm going to add the new resource group to my dashboard so that, that way all these things will be right there each time I come back to the, the home page. So then I'm going to go into my storage account. I'm going to go into containers and in there I'm going to find the file system I asked it to create for me during the setup. And I'm going to select that and then go to the access control settings. I'm going to add a new role assignment here. And the role I'm going to add is the storage blob data contributor. And I'm going to add myself in this role so I will now have permission to upload data. So that's now done. So now all we need to do is use the magic of video editing to make the creation of the workspace happen a little bit faster. And there it is. So now my workspace is ready. I can open it up in the Azure portal. And if I click on this workspace web URL link, that will open the workspace for me. I'm just going to close the introductory screen here because I've got a job to do. To be able to run a Spark job, I'm going to need a Spark cluster setup. And by default, it doesn't actually create one of those for you. So I've got to go into this Manage section and select Apache Spark Pools and add a new pool. I'm going to create the smallest one it's going to let me create here. So I'm going to call it small. I'm going to disable auto scaling. I'm going to select the smallest VM size and then leave it at the lowest number of nodes. That's three nodes. I'm going to click Create. And once this is done, I will have an Apache Spark pool ready for use. It won't start that until I try and do something with it. So it's just sitting there as a configuration setting right now. But as soon as I try and use that, it will automatically spin the thing up. And the default settings mean it will shut down after 15 minutes of inaction. So that means it won't cost me too much money if I forget about it. So. Now that we've got our Apache Spark pool, we need some code to upload. So let's go and build the custom job. So I'm now going to build my custom Spark job in Visual Studio Code. I'm going to start with a very simple .NET application, the simplest one that the template knows how to produce, a basic console app. And I'm going to need the Spark NuGet package. So let's run the .NET add package command and ask for Microsoft.Spark. So that's now there. Let's take a look at the program.cs that the template generated. It's just a straightforward Hello World application, as you can see. Uh, Visual Studio Code wants to add a couple of files to help me build this thing, so let's let it do that. And now I'm going to add in a using directive to say I will be using the Microsoft.Spark SQL features. 
and then let's get going. So I'm going to leave the hello world in there and I'm then going to create a Spark session. So we use the sessions builder here to help me create this thing and I'm going to give it a name so that it can declare itself to the world. And that's actually all I need. So let's just ask it to give me that. And now I can get on with building my query. So I'm going to build an approximation to pi. This is going to work by scattering random points around and then counting them. Let me illustrate. Suppose you have a circle with radius 1 centered on the origin. This is bounded by a square with sides of length 2 also centered on the origin. Now let's start filling that square with randomly positioned dots evenly distributed across the square. Some of those dot centers will be inside the circle and the rest will be outside. We're going to keep count of how many dots end up inside the circle and also how many we have in total. The ratio of these two numbers will be approximately equal to the ratio between the area of the circle and the area of the square. The circle's area is of course pi r squared and since this circle's radius is 1 its area is pi. The square's edges are 2 units long so its area is 4. That means if we divide the number of points in the circle by the total number of points, we'll get a number that is approximately equal to pi divided by 4. So, to get our approximation to pi, we just need to divide the number of points in the circle by the total number of points and then multiply the result by 4. Now let's see how we can embody this in Spark. So, this declares how many iterations I'm going to do of my algorithm and now we're going to build a data frame based query to execute that using Spark's SQL features. So I'm going to start by just asking Spark to give me all the numbers for that row. So it's going to give me numbers 0 to a billion. I don't really care what the numbers are, I just want to have a billion rows to work with. Then for each row that it generates I'm going to write a suggest select statement that generates random coordinate pairs. Now I'm going to do a little time saving trick here. Um, I'm going to tell C Sharp that I would like to be able to use all of the methods defined by the functions class without qualification and that simplifies this sort of code otherwise this gets very busy very quickly. So I'm going to take a random number multiply it by 2 and offset it so that I can get a 2 by 2 square of points centered on the origins. So that's my x coordinate, this is going to be my y coordinate, so now this selects statement is going to generate points scattered evenly across that square. So now I'm going to write a second stage which is going to work out which of those points are inside a unit circle. So I'm going to use the when operation which lets me say if this then that else something else. So I'm going to look at my x coordinate, I'm going to square it in fact, multiply it by itself. So square the x value and we're going to add it to the square of the y value which of course gives us the square of the distance from the origin. So this is how we're going to work out whether the random point from the previous step has fallen inside the circle or not. So we're just comparing it for less than or equal to 1, that's how we test whether it's inside the circle, and we return the value 1 in the case where it is, and otherwise we return 0 to say it's outside the circle. So all the points inside the circle will produce 1, and all the points outside will produce 0 from this step. I'm just going to give this column a name in circle so I don't figure out what it is. And now I want to count how many points ended up inside the circle. So let's use an aggregate function, I'm going to count, use the sum function, to count uh, the number of points in the circle. So just adding up the results of my previous step, all the ones that were in a circle give me a 1, so if I sum them that gives me a count of the number. And I'm going to give that a name so I can remember what it is. And now I've got to do a little bit of adjustment because the answer that comes out is related to pi but it's not actually pi, so I've got to scale it and divide by the total number of rows I created, otherwise it's going to be a billion times too large. And I'm going to call that pi. So now all I have to do is extract the results. So I'm going to tell Spark I would like the first row that comes out of this query. In fact it's the only row um, in this particular case. So I'm going to ask it for head, that's the first row, and then the first column in that row, again the only column in fact, this whole query produces just a single number as its output, and then I'm going to display that. So I'm going to say that pi is very roughly, this is a very rough approximation, very roughly equal to whatever came out of that query. So let's build that, we should be okay. Yep, that looks fine. However, 
To deploy this to Azure Synapse, I'm going to need to create a self-contained .NET deployment. I basically need to have a complete copy of the .NET runtime as part of my package. It is technically possible to target the exact same version of .NET that's already deployed to Azure, but life is much simpler if you just bring your own copy of .NET and deploy that because then you're not taking any dependencies on particular versions of things. So I'm going to use .NET Publish and I'm going to tell it I want to build this for Ubuntu, the version of Linux that is deployed up on Azure Synapse, and I'm building a release build. So that has produced a publish folder, so let's go and find it. This is in the release subfolder of my project because I built it for release mode, and in there, there's a .NET Core 3 folder, and in there, there is a platform-specific folder, and this contains all of the usual build artifacts you expect, and also a publish folder, which contains the full set of files that I need to publish if I'm going to run this as a self-contained app. And you can see I've got the various libraries that make up the functionality of the .NET framework on Linux. And you can see various class libraries. You can also see the Microsoft.Spark DLL that's in there because I added a reference to that NuGet package and it's brought a couple of jar files with it. You can see the DLL that represents my built program and also a stub file that will launch the CLR on Ubuntu and then load my program up. And of course you can see all of the .NET Framework class libraries in here as well because this needs to contain a complete copy of .NET. So I'm going to zip all of those up into one great big zip file and if I go and find that you'll see it's fairly large because it contains all of .NET, there we go, 30 megabytes, um, and that's now ready to upload into Azure Synapse. So let's do that. So here we are back in the Azure Synapse workspace, and the first thing I'm going to need to do is upload a copy of the zip file we just created. So I'm going to go into my file system, and I need to create a folder for that zip file to go into. So let's create that and give it a suitable name. And now let's go into the folder and upload the file we just built. So as you may remember, it's in the bin release folder and then inside the framework and target folder, there's a publish subfolder and this is where I created that zip. So we're gonna select that and ask it to upload. Now this takes a little while because there's a complete copy of the .NET runtime in there. So let's use the magic of video editing to pretend that I have a faster internet connection than I really do. And that's done. So first of all, I'm going to need to grab a copy of the URL that will enable my job definition to access this zip file. Then I go into the develop tab and I create a new Spark job definition. Now I need to set this to be .NET Spark. And then I just paste in the URL to that zip file and tell it which of the files in there is the main executable. Now, if I start typing the name, it will actually auto-complete because it's gone through that file and found its contents and has worked out that some of the files in there are potential candidates. And so if I start writing the Synapse Spark CS, it auto-completes for me. So that's fine. If I do the drop down, you can see the other suggestions, but the one we've got there is the right one. So now all I've got to do is tell it which Spark pool it's going to use, and I've only got the one. How many executors it requires, I'm going to say one should be enough. And now we can click the Submit button to ask Spark to try running this job. So that's been submitted. Now my Spark cluster isn't actually running yet, so the first thing that's going to happen is that that will spin up, and that's going to take a few minutes. Uh, but we'll go and look at the monitor anyway, because this will show us what's going on. If I go into the monitor tab and then click on Apache Spark applications, you can see my Spark jobs. If you've watched my other video on how to do Scala jobs, you can see the one from yesterday, but the one that's still running is the one I just created. So here we go. Um, it's in a submitting state right now, so it's not actually got as far as running because my Spark cluster is still starting up. So once again, we're going to use the magic of video editing to make this happen a bit more quickly. And after a couple of minutes of elapsed time, we start to get some sign of output. So before too much longer, we should start to see some actual work happening. So now it's actually doing something. So it shouldn't be too much longer before we actually get some sort of result. And now it's done. So if we look at the logs, they default to standard error for some reason. But if we look at the standard output, 
you can see the output that my program produced. First of all, there's the hello world message and some debug output, and then the very rough calculated value of pi. So that shows everything you have to do to write a custom Spark job in C-sharp, deploy it to Azure Synapse, and run it. I hope you found this talk useful.